Welcome to another Home Grow TV podcast, where this week we sit down with Mickey from Elevated Cannabis. This dude has been growing for a good minute and definitely knows what he's doing. You can tell when you look at his flowers. We take a deep dive through some of his favorite breeders and strains, and what is going on with my light there? I have no idea what's going on there. But anyway, in this episode, we sit down with our guest and take a deep dive through what it means to be a licensed caregiver and a medicinal patient yourself, as well as we take a segue into edibles. Our guest today has a lot of experience with edibles, and we definitely talk about that, and as well as some specifics on the Rick Simpson oil. I think it's also important to note that our guest today, nor myself, neither one of us are licensed practitioners or medical professionals. So nothing we cover in this podcast is medical advice. It's just simply our guest personal experience when it comes to being a licensed caregiver and a medicinal patient himself. So just sharing his story inside of things. No medicinal advice, guys. I also want to take a second and thank the sponsor of this episode, AC Infinity. This is the company that makes pretty much all the grow gear that I have here on the channel. We've thoroughly tested the 2x4 kit, 4x4 kit, and now 5x10 setup. Recently, they just launched the Ion Frame Evo Series LEDs. This is their first commercial bar style LED that is over spec. They're running the most efficient Evo diodes on the market that have just come out. And I'm currently testing this in my 4x4 and 5x10 setup. Again, check out acinfinity.com to look at everything grow gear. I got links and discount codes down in the description below and use Hongo TV on the website to save 10% at checkout or Hongo TV 10 on Amazon. All right, without further ado, let's jump into this week's podcast. My man, what is up, dude? Thank you so much, bro, for coming to the podcast here today. Yeah, dude, thanks for having me. I'm very, very excited, man. Very, very excited. Dude, I'm always tuning into your lives on Instagram for a while now and Honestly, I've known about Elevated Cannabis for a while, but for some of those tuning in right now that might not know you're tuning into the podcast here, let us, let some of us viewers know a little bit about Elevated Cannabis. Yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, I've been growing growing now for about, I would say, I think six years. Um, yeah. So I kind of, uh, I had a real, a little more real world job uh, in sales and I got pretty sick. I've smoked my whole life and that kind of led me to start growing a little bit uh growing really helped just being with the plants and and all that growing really helped with my uh you know uh i have crohn's disease and so it really helped like st my stomach wise helped me relax yeah. um so yeah that's kind of how it all started and just kind of grew from there i i was really interested in um in building an instagram because i heard from a few friends it was a good place to you know meet like like-minded people growing and stuff so i did that and uh yeah just kind of started off from there and then um yeah it just kind of blew up from there uh right back in the back when it started like 2017 it was a lot easier to build a cannabis account on instagram now it's <laughs> you know they lock everything down and you can't really get many followers and everything but yeah back then it was it was pretty pretty fast paced and yeah it was a lot different than it is now that's for sure what was the content kind of starting off like at the very beginning? I guess you're already growing. When you started your Instagram account, was it you were jumping right into lives where you're just like posting your content and you're growing and sharing that? Like how what was your first content in Instagram? Yeah, so it was mostly just like kind of sharing what was going on. I had a small I had an eight by my eight by eight tent was my first uh first tent. And mm -hmm. so I was just kind of sharing what was going on, you know, pictures, updates, how they were doing. Um I didn't start doing the live thing until I think two, like 2019, I think. Um, okay. but yeah, it was just kind of, um, getting really just trying to grow my following. So posting every day, um, trying to share what I was learning, um, you know, asking questions, trying to, trying to gain some information from what other people were sharing, things like yeah. that. Um, but yeah, you know, if you really posted every day consistently, um, you know, back in 2017, 18, 19, they really, would allow you to grow your following by, you know, 5,000, a thousand followers every couple of weeks. That wow. doesn't happen anymore. Right. Yeah. Dude, yeah. Times are definitely different. And before continuing into like some of the, your Instagram content, your lives to back up to getting into the growing aspect, what was it that had you start your very first grow? Yeah, for sure. So I was kind of, um, you know, I've been a smoker my whole life. Uh, it helps in, uh, greatly with my, with my Crohn's disease. It's like the one thing mm -hmm. that really, really helps me. And, um, I was kind of fed up. I was very surprised at the low quality of can of cannabis at the shops out here. 
Um, yeah. So that's kind of really what started my journey. And, you know, they didn't have always what strains I wanted or it wasn't high enough quality. And I just, you know, wanted to wanted to try my own. And that's really what led me there. And, um, you know, now I can grow whatever I want. And it's, you know, I know what's going into it. You know, I know how much how much love I'm putting into it, exactly what nutrients right. I'm putting into it. And um, yeah, it's a. Uh, it's been great. It's, it's, it's been, it's been a, it's been awesome. I, you know, I used to be in finance. So it was like the total opposite kind of, kind of spectrum that we're, that we're on. I'm very glad I took the leap to growing for sure. Me too, bro. My goodness. Cheers to that, bro. And I, I tune in very often in the mornings, bro. I got my coffee. You're twisting up the community is kind of like hanging out. And I just always love the vibe on your lives that you're doing on Instagram and just the vibe, everyone that's kind of following along with elevated cannabis to, to, to continue. Like when you started your first grow, one of the things that you said, you like, you couldn't, there wasn't the strains that you wanted, right. Or the quality wasn't there at some of the dispensaries and the place you are in. And you're out in Colorado, right? Yep, exactly. Right. So what were some of the strains that you started with that you knew, okay, this is what I want to start with. Tell us the very beginning, the first strains that you started growing in your tents in that journey. That's a a good question. Well, so I didn't, I didn't really know. I didn't know anything about growing. I read a couple books. You know, I had one friend who was a grower who was kind of like my first mentor and I bothered him with, you know, tons of questions all day. I probably bothered him way too much, but he was, he was always super kind about that. Um, but so it was hard to get going. So basically what I did is I just kind of thought of strains that I used to smoke when I was younger, you know, mm-hmm. in college that I really enjoyed. And I would look for those, you know, in seed banks or whatever. So, you know, like OG Kush, some of those like whatever, Bubba Kush, some of those kind of older, heavy indica yeah. strains. That's really what I was into. So those were like really the first few strains. Uh, Sour Diesel. That's one that I really looked looked into at first. Um, yeah. That's how I found Copy. Copy was the... um was pretty much the one breeder who had the most legit sour seeds. Uh, those were the first beans I grew from him. And, gotcha. uh, yeah. So I just kind of looked at strains that I loved and I couldn't really find anywhere. And that's really what, mm-hmm. what, what I went with. Got you. And how did that evolve? Yeah. So that was like your beginning and especially, you know, I find what I like about your, your, what you choose to grow and what I see on your profile, a lot of it seems to have like this medicinal focus on it, right? Whether you're looking That's for right. like these certain cannabinoids or these terpenes. So how did that evolve? What strains did you start to grow into? And then let's get into like some of these cannabinoids and terpenes that you found most effective for the medicinal side. Definitely. So I, I, um, I always was like an OG, you know, an, an, an OG Kush, you know, whatever kind of smoker. I wasn't too yeah. into the more sativa kind of Jack sort of train wreck kind of strains. Mm-hmm. Um, they honestly made my stomach worse. And one of the main reasons I was smoking all the time was because, you know, just right. to help my stomach. If I, yeah. if I, if, if it wasn't for cannabis, I wouldn't be able to eat honestly on a daily basis. So I really wow. need those like heavy indica, re- heavy, relaxing, um, super medicating strains. So, yeah, yeah. so that's really what led me you know honestly before it was really legal it was diff it was obviously more difficult to kind of you know whatever whatever your guy had was what was what you were getting a lot of the time yeah (laughs) luckily growing up in new york there was a pretty big market and there was a lot you know there were a lot of different strains and i always just led towards those you know heavy indica cushy gassy smelling strains those were the mm-hmm. the most that the, those were the ones that helped me most physically and um gotcha. so that's really you know what i what i stuck with when i started growing and so what does that look like now today what are some of these before we even get into the specifics of like the cannabinoids and terps but what are some of the name strains that uh that you're liking nowadays that you consider on that indica hard like that gassy side for sure. So yeah, my, my, I mean, my favorites over the past few years have been, it was previously, I used to smoke high octane all day. It was, ba- it was basically yeah. just like a, a true OG Kush, you know, gotcha. straight, straight green buds, doesn't turn purple, you know, just, but just, you know, it smells identical to OG Kush, very, very gassy. And it was just very relaxing, you know, not, you know, crazy strong, but just super relaxing, um, incredible, incredibly medicating stuff. And, um, soon after that, I found, uh, the Dr. Sleep, which mm. is uh Hellraiser crossed to the drip. Um, Hellraiser is an OG. And, yeah. uh, this has been by far my favorite strain that I've been able to find. Uh, she's not only incredibly potent and medicating, she's absolutely gorgeous. And, um, she's just, you know, she kind of reminds me a little of sour too. So that's mm-hmm. why I think I, I, I just smoke her all, all day long. And, uh, Ooh. yeah, she's got that gas in there, but she's also got that like sour funk in there too. So yeah, those two are really, 
really my my favorites. When I was when I was going to the dispensaries, a few a few of my favorites that I really liked that they just didn't have all the time. Uh, the Skywalker OG, another one of my mm-hmm. favorite cu- uh, cushions, incredibly medicating. Yeah, this one dispensary had this strain, had this one cut of banana Kush that mm-hmm. to this day was some of the most medicating weed I've e- I've ever smoked in my life. I wish I could get that cut. I wish I could get that cut. It was so heavy. Lots of people couldn't smoke it because it would like put them to bed, you know, and that's honestly, right. yeah, that's how the doc, that's how the doctor sleep is as well. Um, mm-hmm. Like a lot of my, you know, I grow, I like, I love growing the doctor sleep, but I also try and grow a variety because, you know, a lot of people don't want that couch lock, you know, kind of super medicating high. They, are, you know, they want a little right. heady, heady high. They want a little energy, you know, they don't, they don't necessarily want to fucking, you know, just be <laughs> not, not that it does that to me. Cause I smoke so much of it. It helps with the pain, right. but the people who aren't smoking a lot, it's going to put you down pretty hard, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, like so that's, that's going to stop me. F- that's going to stop me from editing my video real quick on some of these strains. You know what I mean? Like I'm getting into it. I'm getting in the flow and all of a sudden some of them are just like, bro, stop. It's time to relax. And exactly. others I'm like, all right, bro, I'm going to go hard on this episode all day and get creative. So exactly. I totally get, get where you come from and, and sort of cut you off there. No, no worries. Um, so yeah, one of my, I, I forgot about this one too. One of my other favorites for pain was the cherry runs. Um, mm-hmm. Ooh, in, one of the, good. it's a runs crust to cherry cookies F4. And mm-hmm. it, she was one of the most medicating strains I've ever had. And that was like, you know, it's cause it's tough to describe a strain as medicating. It may yeah. work for me, but it might not necessarily work for you for what maybe for whatever ailment you have. I got confirmation from like several different patients that this was definitely one of one of their favorite and most medicating strains. And I've honestly found that a lot with the with runs and runs crosses. I know runs gets a lot of a lot of mm-hmm. hate because it's so hyped up and everything. But I, I honestly I love it. I think it's it's one of the most medicating strains I've ever smoked. All the crosses I've smoked. I've grown a, grown and smoked a lot of crosses, platinum runs, yeah. uh, platinum runs crossed with purpleata, the cherry runs all just incredibly incredibly medicating and i just assume that has to come from the runs that's beautiful and i like that yeah. you say that because i think it does and now more days you, you you do see a lot of backlash on the runs all oh, runs like yeah. you know it's everything's runs but you know what i feel like i could keep diving through so many different runs crosses finding things that i really do enjoy on the turp profile yeah, yeah. and to talk something like I think you're really bringing up an interesting point when we're talking about these medical effects. And again, that's why I love so much this conversation with you because you really do come from a side of like this for you is a medicine and it is allowing you yeah. to function, you know, on, on a normal basis or at least helping a lot with that sense. What are the cannabinoids? How much have you dove into the labs and testing or research on that side? What are some of the cannabinoids that you think are standing out in these heavier strains that are alleviating some of your symptoms? So I really do need to do more testing. I haven't done much testing. Um, my testing is like my nose and 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 my head and my stomach and how I feel kind gotcha. of after, after I smoke. So I wish yep. I knew the more specific, you know, you know, terpenes that were that were that were making it medicating. However, I will say, you know, mo- mostly, you know, those those gassy cushy strains are, are going to be medic. I I've found them to mostly be medicating. Um, and on the opposite, opposite side of the spectrum, sort of those, um, you know, I would say more, I think it's terpenol and sort of like the really like chemical piney smells sort of mm-hmm. like the, where the Jack and train wreck sort of, sort of, uh, lead you. Those are sort of, to me, more sativa, and, and, and if I smell that, I kind of have an idea that it's not going to be medicating for me. I'm not gotcha. saying hundred percent, but for me, those are the, those are the profiles that I've definitely found, um, yeah. for me to have those effects. Right. And have you had any thought or opinion or anything on like, we're seeing new things like CBG coming out and some plants being like higher in CBG or, you know, different cannabinoids, I guess for you, it's, it's. It's still just leading with your actual test, right? Your nose yeah. and how you feel. Yeah. So, so one thing, uh, CBN is uh, is one thing that's that that's great. It really helps with sleep and pain. And okay. one of the reasons I think the doctor sleep is so helpful is because it's very very high in CBN. I didn't test it personally. Copy tested it um, when he grew it at at fifty six days. It tested almost five percent CBN, which is a very high level. I take it 60, 63 days to get, you know, even those higher, you know, higher, uh, CBN levels. 
higher, yeah. um, you know, amber trichome um, amounts, and uh, she's even more medicating. So yeah, definitely, definitely CBN. I'm, you know, again, I'm just not too familiar with with the actual, you know, what what actual cannabinoids are gonna gonna specifically do what. I do know CBN right. definitely helps though for sleep and pain for sure. Yeah. That's amazing. And I can't wait till technology gets to the point where, you know, yourself as a grower at home could be testing every single one of your plants and seeing exactly what's in there, bro. Could you imagine? And you're like, dude, this thing is hitting so perfect. And I know it's because of this, this, and this. And I'm really hoping that science is going to catch up to us at some point on that. But it really, will. that's what I was. Yeah, it, it will, will, right? It will for sure. That'll be awesome, man. I can't wait for that. And that was another question, too, that I think you answered great was at the, is there anything you do like letting it go longer and would you say that that could be a tip for certain growers if they wanted more cbn or if they wanted something maybe a little bit more of the medicated coach lock or that effect to maybe push their harvest a little bit longer to go further definitely um so yeah so one of the things i wouldn't say you know if you have like a really strong sativa strain and you take it you know 10 days longer i wouldn't right. necessarily say that it's going to turn it into you know, an indica, it will, it will make it more relaxing of a sativa. Um, but mm -hmm. yes, if you take your strains longer, um, the, the amber, the trichomes do turn more amber. That's definitely higher levels of CBN. And it's definitely more of your like kind of couch lock, um, smoke, you know, Got and that's you. why I, I, I definitely like to see, you know, 30%, 30% amber for, for me personally, for my personal smoke, you know, a lot of people don't like that kind of couch lock high, but I, I definitely do. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Dude, before we get into some questions on your grow, like the amazing plants, the results, dude, it's always so fresh and so clean in there. I wanted to ask you something because, again, forgive my, my ignorance here. Or I'm from Canada originally. I'm living in Colombia. I haven't been on that side of the world very often throughout this whole revolution of caregivers, the medicinal side. So I wanted to ask you, like, when you go to your profile and it says, you know, you're Sorry, I'm going to read it directly here. A fully yeah. licensed Colorado uh, medicinal patient and caregiver, right, for Crohn's and chronic pain. What yeah. does it mean to be a caregiver and, and what are the licenses like in that process? Uh, so basically, well, unfortunately, Colorado doesn't have the best like small home growers licenses laws. In a lot of other states, you can, as a small grower, license yourself to shops. We can't do that mm -hmm. here. So basically, the oh, best okay. thing that you can do is get a is get a is get a care caregiver's license, which allows you to sell to other individuals who have their medical licenses in Colorado. Got um, you. I wish it was better. That's pretty much the best we got out here in terms of, you know, um, cultivations licenses, really the best they got is extended plant counts and things like that. And that's really the, the, the best that you can get out here. I wish they had, you know, more, but, uh, for, for what I got, I got enough, um, for the space that I have and yeah, may, you know, maybe, as you know, uh, federally it gets more legal. The Colorado will have better laws for small growers where they can start selling to dispensaries and things like that. But you know, honestly, the you would probably get triple taxed if you were doing that. So here, I'm only getting taxed once, so it's right probably not as bad. <laughs> right? Oh my goodness! Yeah, I yeah. Almost don't even want to enter into that wormhole and and fall, like yeah. see what's going on there in that because it just seems like it's always changing. There's so much going on. But just to sum it up. It, do you think there's big changes coming to that situation in the next little bit? Is it something that you're like, ah, I'm just rolling with the flow right now? Yeah, oh. it's really, t it's so tough. You know, like you would have, you would have thought that this would have been taken care of by now. Like, you know, uh, whatever, right. how many states have it legal medically, how many have it legal re recreationally, you would have thought that it would have been legal federally by now, but obviously the people in charge can't figure out what they want to do and they right. don't, you know, they don't really like, it doesn't seem like they like weed either side, really, you know, both sides have been in charge, both sides have had the opportunity to legalize it and it hasn't happened. So I'm, I'm not, you know, and, and honestly, it's, it, I don't know, a lot of the states that have gone legal, they've done it in such a terrible way that it screws up the market so much. So, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a tough question. You know, I think right. they, I think they need to let, you know, all the small, and even larger cannabis offenders out of jail before they even like start to talk about the federal thing. You know, it's, yeah, it's just crazy that they still, that's, there's still people in jail for cannabis and the government and, you know, other people are making millions of dollars and billions of dollars off of it. So it's crazy when you put it, that it way, is crazy. Bro. 
Yeah. You're nuts. And we could literally do like a whole series of like a debate. It'd be like six hour podcast, bro. Let's exactly. just even trying to scratch the surface on it. So one thing I definitely want to cover, because when I go to your, your Instagram, bro, and I go through like, you know, the pin stories at the top and you got all these different things up there. There's one of the edibles. And I remember when I first found your account years ago and I started looking at your stuff, dude, your, your recipes of edibles and the different stuff. So before we even get to that, to, to bring edibles, extracts versus flour on the table. For sure. You know, what's your what's your general response there for the best way to dose as that's far a, as a caregiver? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think it could also be in two parts, the dosage wise, and then also kind of what helps medically the best, at least personally. Please, yeah. yeah. Um, so, I, I, you know, I smoke concentrates for sure, um, but usually it's less for medical reasons and more like I want to get high pretty quickly and I don't have enough time to roll a joint or whatever. Gotcha, um, yeah. And I find that rosin helps rosin or whatever diamonds whatever help helps my stomach helps my back less so than flour itself so that's why okay. i don't smoke as much as, as much concentrates i find you know smoking a joint um is the best way for me to medicate personally uh, it helps my stomach the most it helps that that's what helps me medically the most um i awesome. also yeah, edible edibles are also incredible Especially edibles made with uh, RSO, Rick Simpson oil, uh, which mm -hmm. we, which we should definitely talk about if if uh, if we have some time. Um, yeah, it's please. definitely the best medicine that this plant has to offer. And so I make all my edibles now with the Rick Simpson oil. So they also have you know they they get you super high, but they also have that medicinal benefit as well. So I think mm -hmm. for me traditionally, like heavy indica edibles have really helped helped me as well. I think even more so than than flour. Wow, that's yeah. that's really cool, and it's really cool to even hear the difference. Again, your your situation being very focused on the on the medicinal side, you know, like really on the on to see the difference from taking a dab to the flower. Because for me and us and our buddy talks, it's always like, oh, you know, it's just you do this for a week and then you go back to a doobie, and it's just such a different experience. Why oh, is totally. it you think this would be like so much harder? And then all of a sudden you do just flower for a week and you go to this and it's a different experience. Yeah. But to hear the medicinal side and, and the immediate effects that you see from that, why do you think it is that you would get more from the flower end than you would from, from this? Do you think we're losing some of those? I, it's, you know, that's a, that's a really good question. I, I, I don't know. This is a total guess. Um, but I think, you know, so like when you take a dab, not that it's intense. It is, it is kind of an intense experience. You know, you're taking, mm -hmm. it's basically your, a, a joints worth of weed in one hit, you know, and that's yeah. like going, it goes to your head a lot of the time, you know, and then kind of eventually you get that body high. But I think for me, um, for my stomach, what I need is relaxation. And I don't think necessarily like taking a huge dab to the face is, is that relaxing. Maybe eventually <laughs> once, once you get, the effects of it, it's more relaxing, but the, still that initial sort of jolt of being that high is just for me, I think not that relaxing. So sort of smoking a joint and getting like s slowly high. Yes, I get, I get, I get very high when I smoke a joint, but you're, you know, you're not doing it in one hit. You're doing it in however many hits it takes you to, to finish the joint. So I think right. that that, I think that that helps. And the same thing kind of with the edibles, you know, it come, it doesn't come hit you all at once. Maybe sometimes it does, but I think the edibles really allow for that body high as well, which, 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 which is incredibly helpful. Dude, um, let's but yeah, dive more it's kind of that jolt, really. I want to dive more into the edibles and talk a little bit about recipes, but I think everyone listening to this and especially us patients listening to it or any patients listening, probably this is like that moment where we're like, okay, I think, uh, you know, that was like the little bell ringing in the ear, oh, bro. Cool. I don't know. I don't know how many you rip a day or how many doobies or if it is your time to dose right cool. now, but I, after that little conversation, I think it's time. So I'm going to go ahead and turn mine on, bro. I don't even know cool. if you have a doobie over there ready. Yeah. Or... Oh, yeah. We got a, we got a joint ready. You know, I'm actually going to go inside so I can I can prop my back up a little bit because I, be, I, I had a heavy week of uh, defoliating my big room last week, and that always kind of kills my back. So it was good timing, actually. Good timing. Dude, you do great work. That's one of the questions I have for later in this, in this podcast, actually, specifically on your defoliation, bro. I feel like that is – you do it really well, bro. So oh, before thanks, we man. get um, – it's funny. I was joking in the live. Uh, hold on. Let me light this. Let me just light this real quick. Yes. Cheers to you guys. Thanks, you guys, for tuning in. Obviously, like we said at the beginning intro before yes, we go dude, into cheers. this. Well, what are, what are you smoking, by the way? This this right here, bro. This is – we got an import from the U.S. Mega Raw Melts. Boss Candy Raw. Boss Candy Raw. Nice. What's she tasting like? Oh, yeah, yeah. I'll let I, this, you. This one is so unique, bro, because – 
I, I'm a very fruity kind of guy. I love fruits of every kind. And I love them if they're ever at all exotic. So off this one, I get like this nice tropical release. But nice. it's almost hit with like a leather or like a bourbon kind of back to it. Like it's a very. Ooh. That sounds delicious. Yeah, it is nice. It's light. I very, very small little dab ski because just like you said, though, sometimes <laughs> the effects and especially it's just like I use my medicine for different situations. For me, it's a very creative stimulant, right? There isn't a video that I've ever done in my eight years of just doing video that it hasn't been driven by creativity of this. It's I'm a blank it's canvas amazing. and then I'll boom. I'll, oh, shit. Let's run with this music. And the music starts driving it. That's so awesome. it's, it has its setting. And sometimes with interviews or getting to know people or going to events, it's not like the best medicine for me to be like, okay, I'm going to take a fat dab and then go meet a bunch of people or do an interview. But I'm finding that balance and I'm kind of finding it's just like a little micro dab or for me, if it's a doobie, one, two, three little hits, depending on the stray and boom, she goes out and, and I kind of go about my day, but I am liking the balance on a small little rip. And what are you smoking on over there? I am smoking on my favorite Dr. Sleep that I told you about, but I also, you know, when I, when I do these things in the middle of the day, she's really heavy. So unless I'm like having a really bad pain day and I'm just kind of, you know, just resting, whatever, taking it easy, I like to mix her with other stuff. So I got her mixed with this stuff called Swamp Ass. It's bred <laughs> by, uh, bread, yeah, it's great. It's bred by Ohm's Law. Great dude. Um, and uh, it is TK91 cross to American Skunk Selection. Mm. And it's got a super delicious, unique. Um, it's like I, I would describe it as sour apples. And I say gas and I, and I spell yeah. it G-A-S-S because the American Skunk Selection has super unique like it's like it's skunk, but it's also something else. So she's got that on the back end as well. And it's really, Ooh, really I'm delicious. looking. I'm and looking at wonderful. this post here, bro. This is unbelievably beautiful too, bro. What fucking Oh, thanks, man. Yeah, she's beautiful and she's got some of the ripest trichomes I've ever seen. And that was at like 62, 63 days too. So I didn't even take her that long. So she's Ooh. not she's she's a, definitely a sativa smoke, but one that I can smoke because She's she's like a relaxing one of those relaxing sativa smokes. She's wonderful. I fucking love this name, dude. The swamp ass, and then with swamp the extra, ass, yeah. it's yeah, perfect, dude. dude. She she ex- reeks. She that reeks. is sick, bro. Yeah. I'm definitely I'm I'm definitely gonna be jotting down. And I often look at your profile. Like I have a few that yeah you've run that I'm like on my must grow list because of that. Like the doctor sleep I wanted to try after your review and and hearing about it. And now that swamp ass, bro. She's on the list, dude. I gotta try oh, yeah, that. Oh yeah. Dude, to dive back into the edibles quick, because I don't want to leave this. You wanted to touch more on the, on the, the Rick Simpson oil, but I want to also talk about the doses, what you think is good for, for you know, or what the amount of dose you think is good for certain patients and, and you as a caregiver. Because I seen that one post, it was like, what was it, 2,000 milligram per little chunk or something, or per like bite, or was I looking at that wrong? Was that 200? What are you talking about? Are you talking about specifically Rick Simpson oil? Um, I was talking about edibles first and the, the, the numbers I was just throwing out. I was looking at one of your stories that you threw up here. You're making, I think it was the mac and cheese and then you were, oh no, the, the cubes. Oh. I'm pulling it. Yeah. 2000, approximately 2000 milligrams total dose. Your oh, cereal. So yeah, okay. So that was every, so that was the whole, so that was 20, 20 different edibles. Yeah. 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 Got you. Okay. Got um, you. Got so you. Was, so basically like a hundred milligrams each essentially. <coughs> um, okay. So, so what, what is an average dose? Sorry. And I'll let you take it away there. I'll let you go there. No, that's okay. So the, it's a tough question because I think it, I think it determ- it depends a lot on, you know, how much you smoke, you know, what your tolerance is, blah, 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 blah. So if you're, you know, an everyday smoker and you're smoking every day for pain, like mm-hmm. for me, I think it's a little different. I, I smoke a ton. I eat a lot of RSO. So my tolerance is like through the roof. So I can eat 200, you know, 200 milligrams, be totally fine, get a, a shitload of work done. And it, it obviously, it, you know, it works actually towards my pain centers and doesn't get me high. Um, gotcha, or it does, it. it does get me high, but it, it, it helps with the pain. If someone, you know, who doesn't smoke a lot were to eat 200 milligrams, they would, you know, lose their fucking minds, thinks they were like tripping balls or something like that. Got you. So I think for like an average person who smokes a lot and who's looking to, um, you know, calm their pain. I think somewhere from 50 to 75 milligrams would be a good place to start. Um, okay. If you, this is for, this is for like an everyday smoker. Got gotcha. you. Don't, this is for an everyday smoker. If you're, if you're not, if you're not smoking every day, I would start very small, you know, five to 10 milligrams max. 
Got you. Um, so yeah, my mom, like, my mom often asks, and now she's in she's in Canada, and she's often asking like, oh, we're gonna go get some gummies and this. Like, where do you think I should start? And me in Colombia, it's it's hard because we don't know this the certified doses or what's really going on when we go to a cannabis cup or we get our Doritos or nachos that say it's six hundred milligrams. I don't really know because when I eat that whole pack, I know what I in theory I should be feeling and it doesn't so it's just hard to vary and, and sure. I have a hard time responding to her and that's why I thought it was such well, a good question definitely. so for my mom not knowing anything you would recommend for her 5 How to 10 her, does, she smoke, does she smoke at all? she would She would be like once twice a year type thing okay. if it's a very special occasion I, honestly to start I would recommend 2.5 milligrams 2.5 to 5 milligrams max if you're not if you're Gosh. not a smoker that's where I would start that's just to kind of make sure that not, you know you don't have a bad time you know, you're not going to have you. a bad time at that level. Sometimes 10 milligrams can be a little much for people who don't smoke. So that's usually for my friends that don't smoke very much and they, always, you know, they ask for something. That's what I recommend. That's usually what Got I you. recommend. And then kind of after, you know, you try that, you see how it goes. I would, I would try the like 10 milligrams, you know, and then if, if you're liking that, you can slowly up it from there. That's, that's what I would recommend for, for people like your mother. And and so like would it, and it's her first time she wants to try it. Let's say she's working Monday through Friday. Should she do her first doses and try that on a weekend when she has nothing else to do, just in case? Or is it safe to like try small doses? Let's say if she's having pain that morning, she's going to go to work. So okay, so for pain, what I what I would recommend, and this is something I do with a lot with my RSO patients because RSO is very strong and it takes a lot to get used to RSO. So if you're if you're trying to take it for pain, if your mom's if your mom's got some pain, what I would recommend is taking it before about an hour before bed. Gotcha. So try taking it about an hour before bed and seeing how that, how it'll probably help her sleep better, you know, seeing yeah. how that helps with the pain because then during the day, you'll still have that relief from taking it the night before, but you won't be stoned. You won't be high. So that's Got usually, you. that's usually what I recommend, especially for beginners. Um, yes. I've, um, I've been working with someone who, who was, who's been on opioids, uh, um, you know, twice a day. And what I recommended they do is start with a very small amount of RSO before bed. Cause it's really strong. And, you know, if you take too much, you basically just sleep, you just, you just sleep a little too much, which, right. which is fine. So you take a little before bed and that's how you get sort of acclimated to how strong it is. And then once you get acclimated, you can start taking it during the day and it doesn't necessarily, like I was saying before, it doesn't necessarily get you high because you're already used to it. It just works towards working with your pain. And right. my this this is one of my most recent patients. She's been taking op opioids for years. She was able to completely cut out opiates and only take Rip, Rick Simpson oil now over over about a month and a half of getting off opioids, getting onto the Rick Simpson oil. And I, you know, they are, they are both so thankful and it's one of the, it's wow. one of my favorite things about this is being able to, to help people like that. Cause it's, um, you know, it's sad that this is not, this is not something that's legal. You can go in and, and get at, at, at a pharmacy because it's helping people so much. It's not, it's not as addictive as opioids. It doesn't make, you know, right. it, 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 it's, it's just so much better in so many ways. So, so yeah, it's, um, it's incredible stuff. It really it kind of upsets me a little talking about that. It's just not, you know, it's not available everywhere that it helps with so many different things, you know? That's an incredible story. And that is a big statement, right? To get off that. And I think everyone listening to this has knows someone or has had an experience with opioids and that kind of thing. It's just unbelievable the difference to be able to get it naturally the way you feel. And I'm sure the difference of not being addicted to something as well, right? In in that sense. Exactly. Exactly. It's just, you know, you don't, it, yeah, it's just so much less intense. You know, it's not, you don't have that nagging of needing to take something. It's just, you want to take something because it's helping in a, in a good way, not, not a negative way. You're not, I right. mean, yeah, maybe you're maybe a little more tired, you know, a, a, a bit, but I would say taking painkillers, you're probably, you're probably a bit tired as well. So the, the, mm -hmm. I think the, the trade off is, it, it, it's, you know, there's, it, it's not even comparable really, you know? Yeah. Uh, it's, no just, doubt. It, it's just, it's just so much better in every way. And I'm glad I asked about too, the, what you think about how, how to start it. Like, should you do that in the morning before you go to work or like, what's going on? Like, no, definitely start in the evening to, to, to feel yourself out going in, you know, and that totally makes sense to wake up in the morning and you're still feeling those effects. 
um, throughout the day, yeah. dude. That, yeah, exactly. That. Exactly. And then, you know, once she gets used to it, she could definitely take it during the day because again, it, it won't, if she's taking a small amount, it won't necessarily get her high. It'll, it'll just help with whatever she's dealing with. Yeah. And I, and I think for a lot of people just kind of figuring out their <laughs> dose, right. It's and that just kind of takes a few times until you understand, okay, this much does this, this is how I handle this. Right. And for a lot of us beginning our journey into even just medicating with the doobie, it's like, okay, you know, smoking a few puffs is going to feel like this, ripping a full doobie. And then it's just kind of figuring out that, that kind of beginning. I want to transition oh. things into the growing side. Cause I feel like growing is the same thing. There's so many questions and then you get a few grows under your belt and it all kind of starts to make sense and the problems and, you know, where to sort kind of go through, uh, through information. But let's talk about your general setup. And what you have set up now, what kind of lights you're running, how many plants you have in there. And then we'll kind of go through some specific questions on your LEDs, favorite tools and that kind of stuff. But what's your general setup right now and how many plants you got going or rooms? For sure. For sure. So um, right now um, I have two bigger rooms. Uh, one's eight lights, one, one's four lights. Um, you know, the bigger room is the one that I just stripped down. We like to call our Space Mountain. Um, so I got mm-hmm. eight lights in there. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I got the, I, I run the current culture, um, hydro buckets, uh, undercurrent buckets in, uh, in my big rooms in my, in, in my production rooms. And, uh, in the big room, I got two sides, two, two systems, each with 14 plants. So 28 plants total. Um, and then in my small room down there, it's not as economical, um, but I basically just turned it into my doctor's sleep room because I never want to run out of her ever again. Um, So I don't really care that much. So I got four lights down there and only nine buckets. So, you know, if it was like comparable in terms of how many buckets I had in the big room, I would have four more buckets in there. Yeah. Five more buckets actually in there, but it's just in a tent in a garage. So I don't necessarily have the space. Hopefully I'll be able to build that out one day. It just hasn't been my priority. So yeah, so I got four lights and nine buckets down there. And then for my smaller projects, you know, I'm always doing pheno hunts. I got yep. a five by five and a five by three tent. And then I have a couple, you know, smaller veg tents where I do my, my cloning and my mom's and my aero cloners, uh, easy cloners and all that good stuff. That's sick, bro. I, I immediately, yeah. one thing you mentioned on your pheno hunts, what's that process look like for you? Like how many do you get to hunt through? What's a, a nice amount that you like to see? Like what's a pheno hunt look like for you on your end? Yeah, for sure. So the one I'm doing right now is 25 plants, and I think it's about uh, six or seven different sh- – I believe it's six – I think it's seven actually different strains. Usually it's like five. This time I kind of wanted to just yeah. fucking grow as many as I can. You know, I've really – I think the market right now is is so messed up, and I really think it's important to have unique – awesome, delicious, beautiful strains that no one else has. So I've really been focused on pheno hunting a lot and just trying to find those phenos that, you know, no, that no one else has even kind of seen before or, you know, smoked before or whatever. And so, yeah, yeah, I tried to do as many different strains as I could this time. And so, yeah, 25 plants, seven different strains. And, uh, yeah, you know, basically what I do is I clone them all, um, first week of flower. Um, so I have cuts of everything. And kind of, you know, I know by week four, which ones, some of the ones I'm not keeping, like if they don't have the smell that I want, you know, they're, yeah. or, you know, if I don't like whatever smell they have, I just toss the, the, the clones, not the plants that I'm actually growing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, yeah, you know, I'll just grow them out. And then obviously if they, if they don't have that look I want, um, if they don't have that smell I want usually I'll, I'll, I'll toss the clones, but sometimes, I don't know, I kind of get a feeling they may smoke great. So I'll keep them around, but yeah, yeah, it always comes down to the final smoke, right? Like if that's, that's obviously the most important part. If I'm not liking the smoke, you know, you're not going to be keeping the feet. I'm not going to be keeping the phenos. Um, so yeah, so that's, how, that's really how I do it. Um, I usually kind of keep, if it's 25 plants, it'll probably be like, you know, three, three or four that I like to keep. Uh, Mm -hmm. and yeah, usually, you know, I've been running, I've been running copy copycat for years and, you know, I'm always finding just tons. It's really hard to choose the keepers because, you know, most of them look so, so, so good. So yeah, I'm, I'm very lucky to have that, have that problem. And how many keeper mums like would you have like let's say right now in this moment? And is it something that you kind of switch out every few years or do you have something that you like you keep them forever? How does that work? Yeah, so now I have I have a lot because I just did a lot of pheno hunts and 
Um, I there's a lot of plants I really like, and I haven't been able to smoke them yet because they're not chopped down yet. So yeah. I have a lot of moms going right now. Most of them are in smaller solar cups. Probably like you know 30, 35 moms going right now. It's That's usually sick. closer to like fifteen, twenty, I would say. Yeah. Um, and how I kind of do that is so for my big production rooms, I like to keep the moms really big, obviously, uh, just mm-hmm. so I can take those big, you know, those big monster cuts. So I have you know whatever whatever strains I'm growing next, I'll have those big moms. So three different big moms um, in a separate tent. And then the rest of the moms that I have are just like in small solo cups, basically, because I I don't need to keep them very big. I just keep them around in case I'm doing breeding projects or I want to take cuts for, you know, people who want them. Um, So, yeah, that's really how I do the the moms. And I'm I'm resetting. I'm sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. No, you go ahead. Go ahead. So I'm resetting them kind of all the time because so basically how I have going, I have uh, three different strains now in in the big room. Mm-hmm. And the doctor sleep down in, in the eight by eight. So I got because I'm do, always doing the doctor sleep. I always have a big mom, a doctor sleep. And then I am doing sour diesel and the Don next in the big room. So I have those starting to grow in three gallon pots uh, in my mom room, in my mom tent. And the plants that are down there right now, I already tossed those moms out. So they're just in small solo cups. So it's kind of nice. like always a rotation. So I don't have to always be keeping big, big moms. Right. Yeah. And never really, and, and the least amount of downtime possible, huh? Like you just have good selection going in nonstop. Yeah, exactly. Well, so, um, I kind of always try and do in my big room, at least one OG leaning strain and sort of Mm -hmm. one, maybe like candy or, you know, whatever sweeter strain, you know, for people. Yeah, exactly. For people who like, for, for a lot of people who like those. Um, so Mm -hmm. I like to do I like to do a little mix. Um so I always kind of got those on deck and uh yeah. Um I'm super lucky Copy's Copy's been a big friend of mine so he's always hooking it up with with new new dank um new, new dank cuts and everything so That's Yeah, definitely sick, very bro. grateful for that. I'm doing a nice hunt right now. We got 50 in Columbia. It's awesome. the biggest hunt we've ever done like Home Grow Tea. We're doing it collectively with just we have some outdoor going, you know, I got 20 here at my place, got some other grow bros going and we're just just trying to get a lay of the land and figure out because usually I've only never sprouted more than actually one pack of anything. And even then, oh, yeah? for a lot oh, of the cool. episodes, I would always pop one or two just for the episodes and see what come out. So now I want to see like an actually survey. So I'm learning a lot in that aspect. But you mentioned something that I've seen and I wanted to bring up was the breeding. So you have made your own crosses. How did you get into that? And what? what tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, so I made my own crosses, just a couple. Um, I, I I'm running into a space issue now because I have the production and I have the seed hunting. So I got to shut down one of the seed hunting rooms to be able to do another breeding run. Um, but uh, yeah, so what really got me into it, you know, I obviously uh, I've been listening to copy for years, and it had kind of been it, it really started interesting me, and I just really wanted to make strains that I knew I would love and were were very medicating. It always comes back to kind of that that medicating. I wanted those gas OGs. There's a lot of other stuff going around right now. And I just kind of wanted to focus on that. So, and, you know, other people, you know, have other people who wanted to focus on that, you know, have, have that available. So, yeah, so I kind of did that. Uh, My first breeding run, I did a regular, regular seeds. Um, Mm -hmm. I got uh, my mail I got from copy because I didn't want to uh, just hunt, hunt a mail, take, a long time really finding that, you know, stud. Yeah. I, I knew, I knew copy had put in the work and it had been crossed. The mail that I used was, um, high octane crossed to I 95, um, which are two incredibly gassy strains. Yeah. And, um, that was crossed to Mac. Those were crossed to Mac one. So, you know, okay. gas, gas crossed to cross to frost. So yeah. I wanted, you know, I wanted obviously those three things in there, those two things in there. And then I just crossed her to a lot or crossed him to a lot of different gassy strains of mine, uh, high octane, Mr. Big stuff, true chocolate, um, which else, what else did I do? Oh, I did the Hong Kong Kush, and, uh, we also did some great marmalade 2.0 crosses. So that was my first seed run. And then the second one that Sick. I did was a uh, feminized seed run, uh, yeah. copy bless copy blessed me with his reversal, uh, reversal spray. And so I reversed my true chocolate cut, which I named Daryl Strawberry, to a yeah. bunch of different keepers that I had. And yeah, that was my 
I did that in 2021. So that was my second run. And yeah, I'm really, really looking forward to doing a third one. I think the sour that I just found since I've been looking for, you know, a sour that I could call, you know, sour because there's so many sours out there that really just they're sour, but they're not what I remember the sour to be in New York in the early 2000s. And right. uh, I, just, I just found one and I'm very, very much looking forward to bringing her to market and also crossing her to a bunch of different stuff that I think will be uh, will be pretty awesome. So, yeah, so I'll be working on that very soon as well. Dude, that is sick, man. I'm glad. So you definitely have plans to keep that going. That was something that kind of just started as as a curious kind of hobby and an experiment, huh? like things that you wanted to see yeah. flavors kind of cross together and try and and definitely something that you're going to keep going with. Because, I, dude, I see yeah. that. I want to try some of those. Yeah, it's definitely, I would say, more of a hobby. You know, I'm, you know, I'm not trying to trying to blow up a huge business from it, but I just want to kind of make unique, unique strains that, that people are looking for. And a lot, again, a lot toward, towards that kind of that medical side. That's that, that was really what my first, uh, f- first run was, w- was geared towards. And, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I don't know. I see sour kind of coming a lot back a lot these days. I've been looking for my, my, what I remember sour to be for a long time. And I think I finally found her. So, so yeah, looking forward to that a lot. Dude, that's sick. That's something I would love to try, bro, especially on the sour end. We ran something on the channel and, you know, I'll say we, we got some backlash. We'll just say we ran a sour diesel from ILGM, right? We're just getting into the game. We don't, we're trying everything. We always try everything. We, we don't, we I definitely some, don't. I some seeds from them. Sorry to interrupt. Yeah. 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 Yeah, definitely. Right. And it's just like, there's that whole conversation line as well, right? Well, this sour diesel is from this. There's no way, blah, blah, blah. And it's just like, okay, look, we're definitely not looking to get into any drama. I totally get yeah, it. So I'd love to hear someone who is, is looking in, into that sour world who actually knows it. And every day I'm learning more. And that's why I love doing these podcasts is to figure out more information, what's going on and that kind of stuff. So definitely at no point, have we known it all? I don't think we ever will know it all here at Home Grow TV. Um, but we definitely want to grow it all, bro, and try in this lifetime. You know what I mean? <laughs> and some of those flavors, bro, the sour, add me on the list, bro. I have a tester if that's even possible. Home Grow would love to test some of those things yeah, you have dude. coming, I, I coming in the future. I would love to send you some seats. I would definitely send you some seats, man. That would be sick, dude. That would be really cool. And even get those suckers now with our an outdoor to see what's going on. I think the episodes are going to be cool to see that indoor, outdoor, especially in Colombia. We have year round grow season. We get that comment a lot. Why aren't you doing outdoor? So we went and made the connections. And I think we're going to start testing some of that stuff as well. But indoor is, I mean, that's where I started. And I'll always have my interest there, bro, coming from Canada. For sure, man. Outdoor is always fun too. You know, it's, uh, it's definitely a different beast. It's definitely a different beast. Outdoor here, I'm doing my first outdoor here in a long time. I'm putting some big moms that I have outside um, just because I didn't really want to throw them away. They're huge and beautiful. Hell and yeah. you know, a couple of my favorite strains. So I'm just going to throw them outside right here. But yeah, it's, we get every sort of bug imaginable, you know, you get the mold, powdery, milled, everything. The temperatures are, we get crazy differential and night and daytime temperatures out here. So it's difficult, but it's, it's also very fun going out to your plants first thing in the morning with a coffee and a joint when the sun's rising is, you know, some right. of the most relaxing, relaxing stuff you can do in the, in the world. So I'm, totally I'm really cool. looking forward to that. I've often thought, imagine if we, when auto flowers were starting to come out, I was like, imagining just them as house plants. I was like, well, that's make kind of cool, bro. If they were just flowering throughout the house as decorative plants, that totally, would be man. beautiful. Totally. You know what I mean? I'm not looking for awesome. this big, yeah, not this big harvest or anything special, but I just got my house plants everywhere, the auto flowers. I never came through with it. Hopefully one day they just move plant limits everywhere around the world. But I was like, I'm not wasting any plant limits on a decorative yeah, house plant right now. Yeah, for <laughs> make- sure. Yeah, hopefully it would make your house smell pretty good as well, you know? No doubt, bro. <laughs> on breeders, dude, on breeders, what are some of the other breeders that you've liked, that you've been in the game, you've grown a lot of stuff, you know, you obviously have tested a few things. Um, tell me some other breeders that, that you have liked or jumped out to you over the last few years. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think, you know, besides copy, it's, it's people who like, um, I'm friends with who I, I, I know are making their seed, I, who I know are making their seeds on their own and are putting in the work. I think a lot of the big breeders out there don't, don't necessarily do their own breeding. I I think if they did, they'd be proud of it and they would show a lot more of their work. So that's why I kind of, I've, I've kind of strayed away from some of the traditional bigger, bigger breeders out there. Um, Ohm's law is a, is, 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 has become a good friend of mine and uh, he's also a great breeder. Uh, he's, uh, the swamp ass that I was, that was just smoking that I grew, 
uh, was his, and he's doing some really interesting crosses. And uh, yeah, I can't wait to grow some more of his stuff. So he's definitely one of them. Uh, my buddy Jew Grow um, is also I, uh, I I haven't grown any of his stuff yet, but I will be popping some of his seeds um, on on my next run. Um, also, nice. you know, become a pretty good friend of mine. Uh, those two are, in, you know, in the lives most days and, uh, we've got a good rapport. So it's really, you know, people who, you know, friends of mine who I can see, I, I see, I see what they're doing and, and I know they're putting in the work and, 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 and putting fire, fire with fire and hopefully fire will come out usually. So. Heck yeah, bro. Yeah. That's sick. Well, make sure we throw all those up on the screen as well. And, and we have as many links in the description down below for those here watching on, on YouTube. For those growers tuned in, bro, that want to know, they're, right, they're looking at your Instagram, they're seeing some of the pictures we've thrown up today, like, this dude knows what is up. I want to hit the same elevated cannabis level. What are top three tips that you would give to new growers or any growers that you think are important, could be SOPs, or just top three tips for growers getting into the game? That's, def- that's, a, that's a good question. That's a good and tough question. I would say, I think one of the, one of the toughest things and – is 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 avoiding all the noise that's out there you know there's there's so many different nutrient companies lighting companies just everything and i think that they're all trying to sell their whatever they're trying to sell so i i i think really dimming out that noise and and getting sort of one mentor who you can trust who is is not you know is just in it to help you you know whether that's a friend of yours or someone you've met through Instagram I think I think having that one mentor is you know that, that it definitely really helps a lot um, you know you could always you can you could read a book you know you can you know watch videos online but it it, it, it you know nothing helps as much as having someone who you can kind of go to and, and run some questions by good call um, yeah and I think that kind of goes along with. I think the second, excuse me, second most important thing is really just, you know, really just listening to your plants, you know, um, they're literally living, breathing things and they, they, they will tell you when something is wrong, you know? So if, if you really are just paying attention, you go into your room and you kind of see, Oh, that's looking a little wrong. And you don't just brush it off and be like, Oh, you know, it'll, it'll fix itself or whatever you kind of, Mm -hmm. you take that and you can, you know, look things up on the, you know, look things up on the internet. You look at, look at leaf deficiency charts, see what's going on with your plants. I think, I think, listen, I think too few growers kind of just don't really listen to their plants. They kind of just follow a strict schedule or whatever it is, whatever someone told them to do. And they forget to kind of listen, listen to their plants. And I think that's, that's definitely really, 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 uh, really important thing to do. And I think it's really easy to do yeah. too. You know, it's not um, obviously on a larger scale. And that's why I think product, you know, cannabis gets lower quality as you get larger, lo- really larger, larger scale, pretty much. It, it is because, you know, you can't, you can't do that. You can't watch every single plant and figure out mm-hmm. what's going on. But for smaller growers on a smaller scale, you can, and you can really understand what's going on with your plant. And I, you know, yep. I think that's, you know, one of the most important things about growing for sure. Um, Dude, yes. And if there, and I think, you, you know, a, just, sorry, sorry. What, what were you going to say? I was just going to say, if you have a third one that, uh, that popped up. Yeah, for sure. And I think just really put, you know, putting it, putting in the work. I think a lot of people, a lot of people get into growing and, they think, you know, it's like an, e- it's, it's, it, 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 once you, once you get into the flow of it, it gets easier, but it's definitely not easy to grow, you know, really quality, um, you know, high quality, um, great smokable cannabis, you know, it, t- yeah. it takes, it takes work, it takes time, it takes effort. And I think, you know, just putting in that work is just, you know, whether that's, whether you have one plant or you have fucking, you know, a thousand, just do whatever you need to do to make those plants happy um, and yeah. to uh, to learn about whatever's going on in your tent to get that environment right, to get those, you know, those par levels right, to get everything, you know, exactly right. So your plants are thriving. And uh, yeah, I think that just, that just comes down to putting in the work and practice really makes perfect. Um, for, yeah, and, yeah. 
Well said, man. And I think when I go to your profile, I'm like, dude, this guy does the work. He knows what is up. And it looks so clean. You look like you have such a good regimen when it comes to like your defoliation, lollipopping. So let's say I'm about to go put in the work in the garden, bro. I've been listening to my plants and you're my grow bro, right? You're my buddy. You're my, uh, yeah. I have the honor to be able to call you up and, and ask you for, for advice on this, right? I'm like, dude, I've just been checking on your profile. I see you follow a regiment or maybe you don't, but what, what, what is your approach to defoliation, lollipopping and your timing on it? Um, getting into flower if you want to cover the whole plant's life, but let's touch definitely, on that. Definitely. So, um, in veg, it's just if I see, you know, it's really just kind of keeping the lowers, little lollipopping, keeping the lowers pretty clean, not not allowing any sort of dead leaves to form, anything like that. But you really don't do too much defoliation when they're vegging out. Um, in flower, I used to do a big strip flower day one. I don't do that anymore. I haven't seen too big of a difference. Um, what I do do is I lollipop them on day one of flower. So I get rid of okay. sort of anything, any small branches, any leaves that are on the lowers that are sort of in the middle of the plant that won't be getting any light. I get rid of mm -hmm. all that stuff day one of flower, but I don't strip down the fan leaves day one. Gotcha. Um, I do strip. I, I do a big strip week three. Um, you know, I like to do it somewhere close to day 21. Sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, in my bigger room, I was, I was very pleased that I got it done in two days. Sometimes it takes three, four days. So I start maybe day 17, you know, finish day 20, day 21, but yeah, Not just kind of go in there. Um, I think also with this, and it's one thing that's helped me a lot is, is really just taking your time with things. I know, I know defoliation is not the the most fun thing when it comes to growing, but uh, I found that taking your time definitely helps a lot, you know, at least for me with my back and everything. And uh, yeah, day 21. Um, so I do big, big, big strip, try to remove every fan leave I possibly can. And um, other than that, after that, a lot of people do a big strip on day 42. Mm -hmm. I remove, I remove fan leaves here and there that I see blocking kind of bigger buds. And that's, that's pretty much it. I don't do okay. another big strip. Yeah. And when you remove those little fan leaves here and there, is it like, it could be a few times, like, you know, is it a, so it's not a specific day. It's just whenever you see them and you're not worried about any of that stress. It's just a few here and there. Yeah. It's not like I don't do a big strip. If I see some fan leaves kind of like, you know, rustling on, on, on some tops or something, or if I'm back there and I think it's getting a little too crowded and, you know, and they're not getting enough wind, uh, not getting enough airflow underneath or something, I'll remove a little more, but yeah, it's not really like a, I don't do a big strip, but I do remove them here and there. Yeah. Dude, what, one of the other things I see dangling around and, and it got me interested and recently I've just decided I've to decided dive deeper to into my metrics is the pulse and VPD. How much has that played a role into your growing, looking at your metrics and that kind of stuff with the pulse pro uh, and the VPD charts and stuff? Yeah. So the pulse, I love the pulse is awesome. Uh, great company, great devices. I'm looking forward to uh, working with their new pulse hub, which will yeah. allow me to monitor my water uh, conditions in my, in my, uh, current cultures. So that's, that's kind of the last thing that makes me a little stressed out is not knowing exactly what my water conditions are. So I'll be able to do that with a new pulse hub. So I'm really excited. Um, but yeah, so, you know, I, VPD is not something that I am crazy concerned about. I, I definitely look at it more now that I have, that I have the ability to monitor it. With the current culture, um, they have a very specific set of guidelines that I have followed since I've been using current culture, and I like to follow those those guidelines. They're gotcha. slightly a little off from VPD. They have a little bit lower humidity, especially towards the beginning of flower. Um, so it's slightly lower, or high, I guess your VPD levels are slightly higher. Humidity mm -hmm. levels are slightly lower. And I think that just has to do with the current culture and the amount of water in there. And it right. just worked, it just worked really well for me. So when something's going really well, I don't necessarily want to tweak it, you know? Um, I like that. And so I think VPD is definitely important, but it's not something that I, you know, uh, pay a crazy amount of attention to. I like that, bro. No, that's yeah. great. And that's a perfect answer. And I think you nailed it right there. When you say something's working, you're on to something. <laughs> What's really the the point of changing it? Um, yeah. Well, I think that's, right? a, that's a big thing that beginners do is they, you know, 
and this is this comes back to one of my big things is kind of tuning out all the noise is you know there's just so many new products and new nutrient companies and just every new new lights and you just want it, well, if you find something that works yeah you know you can you can tweak tweak you know use maybe one one new thing here and there but don't go and change your whole nutrient line or you know cha- change something huge in your grow just because you see a few other people doing it. Um, yeah. I think that, you know, I think that that's a big pro, you know, and I think that's where a lot of people get into trouble because you have something good going and then what, what works for someone else isn't going to work for you necessarily. Um, a lot of mm-hmm. the time, uh, honestly. So I think, you know, small changes are also a bit, a bit, a, a big, a big, uh, you know, something that new growers need for, for sure should take into account. Um, and, yep. and, you know, not, not try and throw too much at yourself and yeah, just, just, just try and start simple and stay simple. Really well said, bro. No yeah. doubt. You can get so lost on, on today's just Instagram alone, bro. And a little exactly. YouTube and all the other places. And I think a lot of people assume like if me and you just do a call offline, it's just me and you talking like that. We're talking about, you know, we're running different lights, but at no point in the call, you're trying to tell me like, dude, you got to switch over to these lights. Cause that's the major difference between what's going on here. Yeah. We're talking about totally different things. If anything, we're talking about genetics and genetics. different things and, yeah. and, you know, tests and different stuff there. It really is the biggest, the biggest factor. So I think you nailed it there. For those who want to keep up to date, bro, see more elevated cannabis, where where do we go? How do we keep up to date with everything that you got coming out? Uh, yeah, you know, you can just follow me on Instagram, um, elevated underscore cannabis. And then I also have the um, genetics page, which I haven't posted on much because I haven't haven't done any new genetics recently. But yeah, it's elevated underscore exotics with an X underscore. Um those are both heavily shadow banned. So I think you need to type in the entire handle to actually see my profile. So <laughs> don't get discouraged if you type in elevated underscore canna and you don't see it. You literally need to type in the entire handle to be able to see it. Yeah. Yeah, right. That's why often in these, we make sure that we have everything up with video and that we can show it. We'll make sure we have everything linked down below as well. Dude, I just want to thank you so much, bro, for taking the time to come out, hang out on the podcast, bro. Yeah, man, I really appreciate you having me on. It's been something I've wanted to do for a while. Seem like a su- super cool dude. I wish we could fucking smoke in real life. Hopefully, one day we get to that. And dude, um, yeah, right? once uh, once I make some new genetics, or even before then, I'd love to send you some stuff. So definitely, let's do dude. It. Well, I'm cheersing once again to you, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in, guys. Make sure you go ahead, check out everything Elevated Cannabis, all down below. And if you guys are listening to on Spotify or on. Uh, Apple Podcasts, we'll hop over to YouTube and find the links there. I'll put them out here somewhere, but this one's already heated up and going, so I'm going to hit this. Fuck yeah, dude. Hell yeah, dude. Yeah, I got a little of this joint left, so I'll, I'll light her up with you at the end. Let's do it. Here's our outro. Much love to everyone tuning in. Thank you guys so much, and we'll see you guys next week on Homegrow TV. Thank you, dude. I really appreciate it, man. Have a wonderful day, all right? Much love, dude.